This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Clinton Thurber. Welcome to our kickoff episode of Fellows Corner, a periodic exploration of topics of current interest to EP fellows. Early career EP, EPs may find many of these topics useful as well. 2020 has been a year we all like to forget in more ways than one. While it was the year that many of us first year fellows embarked on our long awaited EP career, it also introduced a pandemic which changed the employment landscape for our senior fellows. The traditional job hunt for senior fellows was flipped on its head. And against this backdrop, many senior fellows around the country are pursuing employment opportunities which may look a bit different than expected. For part one of this two-part series on the job search for fellows, I'm honored today to have with me this evening, Dr. Hemel Nayak from the University of Chicago, where he's an associate professor of medicine. He serves as EP Fellowship Program Director and is the director of their lead management program. He is uniquely qualified to address this topic today as he has enjoyed success in multiple career settings. From traditional academic posts to private practice and larger employed physician groups. Welcome, Dr. Nayak. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for having me, Clint. Sure. Well, let me start uh, right off the bat by asking yourself, first, put yourself in the shoes of a graduating fellow in the year 2021, this June. Now, having all the benefit of hindsight that you've gained uh, from a broad and diverse career, what questions would you ask yourself in evaluating and comparing a job in a traditional university academic setting versus an alternate setting? be it hybrid, large health system, hospital employed, or a true private practice? Sure, I think you know, over the last, I'd say, decade or so, the, the worlds of academic practice and private practice have, are merging. They're getting closer in terms of the types of procedures one does, as well as the salaries, um, as well as kind of what you do on a daily basis. Uh, that being said, I do think there are some important distinctions between the two worlds. And what makes the two worlds kind of come together is the fact that most cardiologists these days, that includes electrophysiologists, are employed physicians. So they're employed either by the hospital system, whether that is in a more of a private practice model, or in an, certainly in an academic position where you are an employee of a medical school or a university or a health system. And that's kind of what brings them together. So if I was graduating, I would sort of have a heart to heart talk with myself and really ask myself a couple of questions. Um, and some of them are very basic, right? Geography, is there a particular area in the country I need to be or I want to be? Number two, you know, family obligations or desires, spousal desires. Um, do I want to settle here? Do I want to settle there? Do I have to look for a job? Does my partner need a job in a certain area, in a certain field? Assuming that that's all flexible and that really it's the choice is based on you, then I think you have to ask yourself, okay, A, what do I enjoy doing? Do I really just enjoy taking care of patients, doing procedures um, and, you know, seeing patients in clinic, or do I want more of a variety of the things that I do? You know, do I like the aspect of doing research, investigation, um, writing papers, um, having some sort of camaraderie with my group to talk about interesting findings and things? And so that's kind of, I think, where I would start. Got it. It's so interesting to hear that these worlds are emerging. You know, we hear often about the tr kind of the traditional uh, insights of these um, different settings, and it seems like there's a lot more options these days than um, the standard private practice model or the academic model. No, absolutely. I mean, there's traditional academic practices still exist. So I'm in one right now. And so I work at the University of Chicago. I am employed by the University of Chicago Medicine. I have an appointment in the medical school um, and it's very traditionally academic. I do fund cases, but I teach fellows. We have a fellowship program, a residency program. I'm involved in that with the cardiology fellows. It's very purely academic. Then there's still these private practice opportunities that you, you traditionally hear about. There are folks that are called EP Mavericks. They are solo EPs working in certain segments of the country, and they're just doing EP-only practice. They rely on a group of cardiologists to refer to them. And then somewhere in the middle is the bulk of kind of where everyone sits. These hybrid models where, for example, you can join a group of a cardiology group that's owned by a hospital. 
but you may have a, inter, uh, a, a internal medicine training program there or, or a cardiology fellowship program there. You may not have an EP fellowship program there. So you'll have the opportunity to teach and do those things and interact. Um, and so there's a variety of these types of practices now. And then one new thing that has come up is your hospital employed electrophysiologist. So the hospital itself will say, you know what, we're going to hire our own EP because that EP now becomes Switzerland. You know, all the other cardiology groups can refer to this EP because he's just going to do EP. He's not affiliated with any of the other groups. The hospital makes money, the EP makes money, and the other groups kind of don't feel as threatened. And that's kind of the newest sort of position that I've seen over the last couple of years. Got it. So kind of along that vein, if these fellows, several right now, I think are still in their final stages, but evaluating multiple job offers, what are some less obvious factors um, that you think might be important to pay close attention to? Yeah. And so when you join a practice, uh, let's say you join sort of a, a, a model where you, there was a former private practice of cardiologists who have now sold their practice to the hospital. So they're now hospital employees. Uh, and when, when these mergers took place over the last, say, 10 years, everyone focused in on kind of money. Oh, uh, how, much, how much money am I going to get per RVU I generate? And these were the contract negotiations that took place. And I was involved in, in a lot of those when I was in my practice in, 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 the, in the suburbs of, of Chicago. Uh, but we also then remembered to focus in on something called governance. You want to be able to join a group that has the ability to make decisions about cardiology without major hospital and administrative involvement. For example, you wanna to go to a group that is able to do the hiring and the firing, is able to say, you know what, we think we need an APN, we're gonna go ahead and move forward and do that because we think it makes sense for us in our cost structure. So governance is very important. So when you join a group, kind of get a, get a sense of how does the group function? Is there a structure? You know, how do decisions get made? You know, if we want to sort of expand to a different part of the city, how is that done? And so um, that's something that most people don't really think about because everyone's focused on, well, how much money am I going to make in my first year versus my second year? Is there some sort of partnership issue? But focusing on the governance aspect. Yeah, it seems like issues would come up later, always, um, beyond the initial interview that you might wish you had some, uh, some say in. And um, Beyond, yeah, like you said, beyond the initial contract, that would be important to have that voice at the table. Um, in your experience with, the, with those employed uh, positions like multi-specialty groups and large, large systems, you mentioned um, opinions on hiring. Obviously, physicians are hired by um, leadership in higher roles, but uh, with, with APPs and nurses and things, um, have you seen that uh, physicians in those types of groups have have that uh, ability. It seems to be a more common employment model now to be in those large multi-specialty groups. Yeah, so there's a number of, of, of sort of hospital systems that will have um, a, a multi-specialty leadership board. So there's somebody from, for example, medicine or somebody from, you know, oncology, if it's a multi-specialty group. Cardiology is generally always very well represented. Why? Because cardiology brings in a lot of money. And, you know, the bottom line is in, in private practice, you know, everyone talks about it. It's not about the money. No, it's all about the money. And that basically is the honest truth in terms of how power is sort of dealt with in those type of groups. Um, so I rest assured, I think as an electrophysiologist and, and amongst cardiologists, remember that electrophysiologists make probably the highest, num highest salaries in, within the cardiology groups. And that was borne out over the last couple of, uh, couple of years in some of the MGMA uh, findings. And so um, rest assured, cardiology will be in a leadership position in any group that you join. And then the other universal truth I think everyone needs to realize is that every, take a deep breath. There are a lot more jobs than graduating fellows last year when the pandemic was at its height. You know, the pandemic hit everybody sometime in around April, March. Those graduating fellows in June, you know, things were a little bit kind of shaky in terms of, you know, do we actually have positions in these areas given the, the climate? But at the, end of the, at the end of the day, there are plenty more jobs than they were graduating fellows. And I think that's going to hold true for this year as well. Yeah, that's a... Um, that's, uh... Awesome to hear and even a little bit uh, uh, surprising, I think, um, especially given the, the landscape this last year. Yep. So um, kind of along that, uh, there seem to be many fellows this year taking uh, private or employed positions. 
who at least in my conversations have expressed uh, interest in pivoting back to academics at some point. Um, our industry dogma says this can be a challenge, although your career is a testament to its possibility. So what advice might you have uh, for fellows in that situation? So, I mean, I'm the poster child for never say never. Um, you never know where your career is going to lead you and it's all a matter of, of sort of embracing opportunities that come along. I will tell you honestly, that it is much easier to go to a private practice model from an academic position. It is harder to go back to academics. And the reason why it's difficult is really the number of years you're out. So if you're out one or two years, that's great. And you decide you want to make a change in your career and you, you really want to wish to go back into an academic type of model or some sort of more of a hybrid model. How do you do that? Well, if you are at all interested in that at some point, you know, stay in touch with your institution, stay in touch with the people there, engage, you know, um, ask to sort of, hey, if you have a lecture coming up or if there's something virtual going on, can you, can you include me in the email list? Um, and so, because your best bet if you want to go back to academics would be to go to somewhere where they know you, right? Because you have a, they have a choice to make. If they have a job opening and they can hire somebody right out of fellowship that they don't know versus somebody they do know and like who's been out for two years, who's gained the experience, she might be the right person for that job. So just stay connected and stay engaged. And, uh, and like I said, embrace the opportunities when they come. Now, let's say you're six years out, seven years out. It just gets more and more difficult to get back into academics because you've lost ground, right? What's important in academics? Honestly, it's going to be your reputation, how many, how much research you've done, how many papers you've sort of written, huh? you know, case reports. In practice, in a true practice model where you're really busy seeing patients, you're really not going to have that opportunity. Now, there's a difference between the, the, the papers that you write and the case reports that you write in academics versus the research that occurs, right? You can do great research in a private practice model, right? A lot of, a lot of companies like, you know, the vendors, Medtronic, Boston, St. Jude, Abbott, you know, Biotronic will go to large, busy EP practices that are in the private practice arena because they churn out a lot of patients. Hey, we want you to enroll, enroll these patients in this post-market study. So that type of research does, can do very, very well. But the investigative stuff that you want to do, to look at a mechanism of something or report on, on, on things, then really academics is where that happens. And the, 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 the number of years you stay away from that, the more ground you lose. I imagine it's also hard to stay connected with uh, the academic world seems like kind of a tight knit family in a good way. I think an EP and uh, periodic meetings seems like wouldn't be enough to stay in touch with your mentors and, and other, um, you know, you know, role models, clinician role models that you've met along the way. Yeah. Um, lastly, I wanted to ask, there's a, a concept that some con are concerned about, um, the concept of practicing on an island, quote, um, early in your career. So it seems common to hear from cardiology groups who are seeking to have just one or two EPs to round out their group. Um, some of these are great jobs, but what challenges might you predict in a scenario like this right out of fellowship? Um, specifically along the lines of continual development of procedural skills, um, growth opportunities, and, and knowledge? So it's a great question. So um, here's, a, here's sort of a scenario. Let's say you're, there's an eight or ten man cardiology group. They have an EP. They're looking for another EP. Then you have to ask, your, ask the group and ask the EP, what do you want me to do? Or what do you envision me doing? Is it number one? on to expand the practice, meaning that EP is so busy and there's such a backlog of cases that we need somebody to do the bread and butter cases that are coming in. So what's bread and butter right now? AFib ablation devices. That's bread and butter. Okay. And then put in there now leadless and watchmen, something along those lines. Or we know we're very busy in this hospital, this side of town, but the other hospital on the other side of town, mm -hmm. we want to develop a practice. We want you to go there and build that EP practice. And that's just a different way, you know, try to get business, do bread and butter things. The third possibility is that I, we need you to bring in new technology, new procedures. Our EP, great guy, but doesn't really do VT ablation. We've seen that that's an increase in growth for us. And right now we've been sending it away to the university hospital, which is, you know, an hour away. We want you to do that. So be 
my, my point is ask specific questions about what my role is going to be. And then remember, um, one of the advantages of an academic practice is that you have mentorship built in, right? You're starting off your, your career. You have a tough case, your, a tough case is coming up. You can easily call three or four different people, get your opinion presented in front of everybody, share the ECG, talk about it, and you're set. If you're having trouble, you can call one of your friends, they'll come down to the lab, help you out. Right? When you're in practice, a true practice model, you can have partners that will help you. You will get mentorship in practice, but many times it's a little bit more difficult. Now in the beginning of your career, it's almost an unwritten rule that your senior EP partner will sort of shadow you, help you, sort of show you how things are done, introduce you to the, to the, the lab staff and the equipment and everything. But remember, that person's gonna be busy. He or she's gonna be busy in hospital A and you're gonna be in hospital B. And so you have to understand that there's mentorship, but it's just in a different way. Got it. Yeah, that seems can seem tricky. I think if you're um, trying to do a lot of procedures that are maybe fringe fringe procedures, not the bread and butter, um, with a lot of steps involved, uh, with the possibility of getting stuck. Uh, I think some worry about um, deteriorating skill sets or or it's choosing easier easier things and kind of forgetting to push themselves a little bit um, based on a perceived lack of bailout uh, uh, from an EP standpoint. I think. Yeah, I think you have to sort of do it in a graduated way, right? You know, your first, the first year you're there, and I, I, I'm, I'm saying this out of, uh, out of experience, you know, the first year you want to make sure that you have good outcomes, right? You're, you don't want to be as the known as the new person that has had bad outcomes. So you want to do good things for good people, have good outcomes. But then if you are trained to do VT ablation, you are going to seek out those type of and you're going to tell your partners, listen, I'm like very, very skilled in VT, even though you haven't done VT here. I think the lab, um, I think everyone knows how to do this. I think I can go ahead and do it. So don't think you feel comfortable doing it. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, Dr. Nayak, that's going to wrap it for us. Uh, thank you so much for choosing to be with us this evening and making the time. Um, all the best with uh, your program there and, and all your clinical work.